fields are white and the workers are few, but the Lord of the harvest is faithful and true. He'll send forth more workers to accomplish his plan and pour out his spirit. Good morning and welcome to my Father's Place. This is Acts Session 28, Being the Church. And we're going to look again at Paul and Silas and Timothy and the rest being the church uh, in all kinds of situations in this rather brief chapter, chapter 17 of Acts. And so I'm going to pray first. Boy, do I need help. (laughs) There are some things in Paul's speech to the folks at Athens that need explanation and that I have been um, studying a lot in order to make sure that I speak this in the best and clearest way possible. Father, thank you for your insight. Thank you that by your spirit you teach me. And uh, Lord, as I know and what I know right now, I will speak this. And Jesus... This is all about proclaiming you, and that's what the church is supposed to do all the time, everywhere to every man, woman, and child. Lord, uh, may we come into that in a much fuller way in the church today. Holy Spirit, you are the one who makes it possible, who makes us so that we say we cannot stop speaking of what we have seen and heard. I pray people would see and hear today and then not be able to stop speaking of it. In Jesus' name, amen. I can't stop speaking. Neither can Paul, neither can Silas, neither can Timothy, and all the rest. So anyway, we'll get into it. If I was going to preach this, Acts 17, I would give it this title. This is another everyone kind of title. Salvation is for everyone, including those who worship many false idols, false gods. So we saw last time in 16, Paul and Silas had just been freed from the prison at Philippi as they worshiped and adored the Lord and sang to him from deep in the prison and prayed. And everybody got set free. Everyone. (laughs) It's an everyone kind of gospel. And so let's see who's going to get set free this time. And uh, so we go through and we see that uh, in verse 1, now when they had traveled through Amphipolis, And Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. They are circling around the Aegean Sea, uh, around the edges of it. It kind of goes like this. And so they are going up and around. And uh, so, in verse 2, he always speaks first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. And so, according to his custom, he went to the Jews in a synagogue in Thessalonica and reasoned with them from the scriptures. Now, with people who already are aware of the scriptures, like the Jews, it's very easy to reason from them. Uh, We will see that he does, he uses a slightly different approach with the very same gospel when he's speaking at Athens. So he reasons, he shows them, look, This proves that Jesus is the Christ. This proves that Jesus is the Christ. This proves that Jesus is the Christ. So that's what he was doing. He was presenting to them evidence. And how he had to suffer, Isaiah 53, among other places, I am sure, and rise again from the dead and sing, this Jesus whom I am proclaiming to you is the Christ. And so he spoke that in the Jewish synagogue at Thessalonica, And in verse 4, some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas along with a large number. This is a very large number of the God-fearing Greeks. That is, those who had been pagans and were now converted to Judaism. 
the God-fearing Greeks and a number of the leading women. So this reasoning that he did in the synagogue caused many people to come to Christ. And so in verse 5, the Jews became jealous. Some of the Jews that had not believed, some of the Jews who had rejected his reasoning, became jealous. Why? Because there were people who were coming to Christ, leaving Judaism and coming to Christ. And so they were losing their people. And that made them jealous of Paul because he was drawing people away from them. And so they collected some evil men. Now, these are evil. These are wicked men. These are evil men. And they are, let me see, what else does it say about them? Bad men, lewd men. That's what the word wicked means. Bad, wicked, evil men. And so... In verse 5, from the marketplace, and they formed a mob and set the city in an uproar. And attacking the house of Jason, who was, I would say, a new believer in Jesus, they were seeking to bring them, that is Paul and Silas, out to the people. And... uh, Of course, we know from past experience with Paul and Silas and others that they intended to arrest them and try them and persecute them and probably kill them. But they weren't there at Jason's. In verse 6, when they did not find them, they began dragging Jason. They were looking for someone to persecute, so they decided him and some of the other brethren took them before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have upset the world have come here also. Because the Jews had come and found them and were tracking them down. Okay? These men who have upset the world, that is, turned the world upside down. (laughs) Actually, They were turning the world right side up because we're living, beloved, in an upside down world that does not love God and does not adore him and rejects his son. So when we preach the gospel, it is to turn them right side up so that they see God and they see Christ and they come to faith and are saved. So it's really good to turn the world upside down. And that's what you do when you're being the church. Your gospel, what you speak, is going to turn things upside down to the hearers because they're used to thinking as the world thinks. But it really is to get them to see right side up. Hallelujah. So, and let me see. These men who have upset the world, land of verse 6, Oh, who have turned the world upside down have come here also. And Jason has welcomed them, and they all act contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying there is another king, Jesus. Well, they're, they're absolutely right. There is another king, Jesus, and his kingdom is not of this world. And so I'm going to go to my notes off and on a little bit. His kingdom is not of this world. If you want to know where he says that, it is in John 18, 36, and that is before Pilate. And he is, beloved, king of kings and lord of lords. He's over all kings, all men who are kings and all men who are lords. And the reference is in my notes, but it's 1 Timothy six fifteen and Revelation nineteen sixteen. So they, they began bringing these before the authorities, and Jason welcomed them. They stirred up the crowd. That is, they caused them to be agitated. And the city authorities who heard these things. So in verse 9, there was this pledge that Jason and the others had to make, and then they released them. This pledge is like a bond. It's like a promise. 
And what they were promising, most uh, commentators believe, and I agree, was that they wouldn't have Paul and Silas come back. And so then they were released. Okay, they won't come back and bother you anymore. Of course, there's a whole bunch of new Christians there who will, but they promised Paul and Silas would not come back. And so the brethren at Thessalonica, believers at Thessalonica, immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. Now these in the synagogue of the Jews at Berea were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica. And the, the idea of noble-minded is willing to hear. And the idea is generous, generous in being willing to hear. They didn't immediately shut their minds and hearts. Their minds and hearts were open. And the reason we know that is we continue in verse 11, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. And you've heard me refer to Acts 17, 11 with my own teaching. Please, I am glad when you examine the scriptures to see if what I say is true. That means your heart is eager to know the truth. And indeed, you'll find the truth when you examine the scriptures. And in verse 12, the result of their eagerness, of their openness, they believed in verse 12. Therefore, many of them believed, along with a number of the prominent Greek women and men. That is, people who were of Greece, people who had been Gentiles, that is, non-believers both women and men. And the Jews at Thessalonica who had wanted to agitate the crowd and who had dragged Jason before the authorities and all of this, they discovered where Paul and Silas had gone and they went there. And again, they agitated and stirred up the crowds in 13. And so immediately... The brethren sent Paul out to go as far as the sea. That is, they were going to proceed around that area and down to the tip of a peninsula at the ocean. And Silas and Timothy remained there in Berea. Now, where they brought him specifically by the sea, was to Athens in 15. And receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, they left. Paul said, bring them as soon as you can because I'm going to need them here. And we're going to continue on from here. So bring them as soon as you can. So Paul was by himself in Athens. Thanks be to God that in each place, even in Thessalonica, there were hearts that were open. Much more so in Berea, they were much more generous and willing to hear. And they heard according to the reasoning in the scriptures because they were attending synagogue and were aware of what the scriptures were. So now we see what he does with people that don't know the scriptures at all. It's a little different but he doesn't vary from the gospel. He doesn't thumb it down. He doesn't water it down. He doesn't adjust it so people won't be offended. (laughs) Hallelujah. When the church is being the church, we tell the truth. We do understand some people don't know anything about the Bible. And so we adjust what we say in that way. But the truth of the gospel is never compromised by the church when she is being the church. And so in verse 16, he's alone and he's in Athens and he sees that the city is full of idols. I mean, these folks were worshiping everything under the sun. There were idols everywhere. And these idols were to false gods. 
you know, you have the whole Greek god system, and that was their system of religion. And so his spirit was provoked within him. What does that mean? It means he was exasperated. I mean, that when you see false gods and false idols and everything, it, it makes you think, oh my goodness, these people are so lost. And you're angry because whoever is propagating this nonsense is at fault. And the people themselves are. And you just want to set them free of all this stuff. He was exasperated. This word provoked within him, this phrase means he was exasperated. He was irritated intensely and infuriated with holy anger. Now I have to pause here and tell you that today this nation, the United States of America, is full of idols and full of false gods. And I need to ask you, Are you like Paul? Are you infuriated? Do you have holy anger about this? Because these gods are empty and false, and these idols mean nothing? Do you see them? Maybe you don't. Maybe you've been so conditioned by this society that you don't. But I'll tell you, they are in Hollywood, and they are on television, they are on YouTube, They are everywhere. They are in stadiums. They are displayed on the peaks of this nation's government buildings, both state and federal, and in our harbors. Do you see them? I pray the Lord would give the church eyes to see these idols and not to join with them, not to let them possess them, because you know behind every idol is a demon. So what happens when the church does see them? They are like Paul. Paul reasoned, exhorted, disputed, and preached in the synagogue in verse 17, there was a synagogue there, and so he reasoned as he had in the other synagogue and to Jews and God-fearing Gentiles, and he preached also in the marketplace every day to whoever would hear. So there was a synagogue in Athens to whom he spoke. And then he was out in the marketplace where all those who believed in these false gods were. He didn't care who, whoever happened to be present. He would say, let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you about the real God and his son, Jesus Christ, and his purpose in coming, and the good news that you can come to him. So he did that, and when he was in the marketplace there, some of the Greek philosophers, because Greeks have this thing about wisdom. They worship wisdom. They spend all their time thinking thoughts that they believe are wise. But God says all wisdom is foolishness to him, all man's wisdom. There were some Epicureans. That's one stream of wisdom. Stoics, that's another stream of wisdom. And they were meeting with Paul and they were conversing with him. And they were disputing him. And some even called him an idle babbler. Now, to know this, this is in verse 18. To know this, he's literally a loafer, a sponger, a gossip. That's what idle babbler means. Some responded to what he was saying and to his arguments in that way. Remember, he's out of the synagogue. He's in the marketplace among people who have never heard of God. Others said, the ones that didn't call him an idle babbler, said he was proclaiming strange deities, that is, strange gods, ones they had never heard of, because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. 
He didn't hesitate to tell them that they needed Jesus, who was raised from the dead, and therefore proved indeed that he was the savior of all mankind. And so, because these were arguing with him, and this was something new and strange to them, they took him to the Areopagus. Well, they used to, in this place, verse 19, and they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, may we know what this new teaching is which you are proclaiming. They are interested in a natural way because at the Areopagus in 20 and 21, they listened to new things. As a matter of fact, in 21, it says the Athenians and the strangers visiting there used to spend their time in nothing other than telling or hearing something new. So in 21, they said, this is, these are strange things. Now, we want to know what these things mean. Now, the Areopagus is just a large outcropping of rock just outside Athens, and that is simply where these men and women gathered to just talk and come to their own conclusions through man's wisdom. And so they spent their time doing nothing else. So he's brought before them. They say, tell us about this new thing, this strange teaching, these strange deities you're proclaiming. So he stood in the midst of them. And he said, men of Athens, I observe that you are religious in all respects. Religious. You've got gods all over the place. That's why I hate to call Christianity a religion, because it isn't. It's about knowing God intimately. It's about being saved from your sin and then from your sinful nature. It's about being full of God. It has nothing to do with all these idols and, and false gods. And what he is going to do, everything that he says here, every, I have heard more preachers say he was wrong to do this. But what he was doing is exactly what Moses did before Egypt, which was full of false gods, he came contrary. Everything that he said about God in heaven was contrary to the gods that they were worshiping. And God very much meant for him to do that. Paul was filled with the Holy Spirit, so he was doing right by saying what he was saying. He said, you're very religious. You have no relationship with God, but you're religious. It's very possible to be religious and have no relationship with God. So he says, for while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, he says, I found also an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. They wanted to cover all their bases. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance this I proclaim to you. You don't know who this unknown God is, but I'm going to explain to you who he is. And this reminds me of a time that the Lord put it on my heart to go into a head shop when I lived in Maine. This shop had all kinds of satanic idols and different things, drug-related paraphernalia, and these were familiar to me because from the ages of 17 to 20, I was a drug addict and I was a frequenter of head shops. But as I looked around at the gargoyles and, oh, the bongs and incense and oh, everything else that's in a head shop, there stood a cross. Ah! <laughs> Oh, the Lord always provides a way. And so I did as Paul did, and I told him, you don't know this God, but let me tell you about him. And I did. And they didn't, some of them didn't know what to think. But do you know, 
if nothing else, that was seed planted. Someone else would come along and water, and God would give the increase, and that person would come to Christ. Wherever you go, or wherever the Lord leads you to go, speak it. This is what it is to be the church. Speak it in all of its truth. You need to come. Because everything in here that you are worshiping that is a religion, and believe me, the whole drug culture is a religion in a way, all these things mean nothing. This, let me tell you about this one you don't know. Hallelujah. I told them what their cross represented. Glory to God. So in 24, he is proclaiming to people who have never read the scriptures. He says this. God made the world and everything in it. This is God, the creator of all things. Now, this entirely comes against their belief in the Greek God network and religion. The world began in chaos, and then the Greek gods came along and were able to thwart the chaos, but they're always fighting it, and with each other, they always do battle. And so there was no creator God in what these folks believe, but he said, I'm going to tell you about this one. You've got an idol here to an unknown God, and I want to tell you who he is. He's the one who created you. He's the one who created everything. He's made the world and all things in it, including you. He is the Lord of heaven and earth. He dwells in heaven. And he is over all things in the earth. He doesn't dwell in temples made with hands. There were, it being full of idols, Athens had all kinds of temples to all the different gods that they had made with their hands. And he said, this God doesn't dwell there. This, you can't make anything to hold this God. Glory to God. Verse 25, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything. They were always going to him and going to their gods and, and you know, doing things to serve their gods. Because he doesn't need anything. This God, this creator God that I'm telling you about, doesn't need anything. He's the one who gives life to all people and breath to all people and all things. Every creature on the planet. He gives them life and breath. And he made from one man, Paul says in 26, every nation of mankind. Why did he make from one man every nation? Why did he do that? So that they would live on the face of the earth. God is a creator God. He created man to live on the earth. Now we all know Adam fell into sin and the world has been spinning downhill ever since. Except that he sent his son to rescue us from that spinning down. He made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth. And it is not you that determine when you live and when you die. And it is not you that determines where you live and where you don't live. God determines that. He is in charge of all of that. He is a very with you God. He is not a God that is far off. And for them, all of their gods are far off. And they are very capricious. That is, one day they may like you, and the next day they may hate you. And they are also very sensual. So they have the same nature as the people who worship them. God intends that you worship him and he will give you his nature, which is not capricious and not sensual. 
And he is the one who determines how many years you have. And he is the one who determines where you live. Why did he put them on the earth and set boundaries and determine the length of their lives? Why did he make all these nations? That they would seek God. That they would seek the one true God. That they would try to make contact with him. Because all of creation speaks of him from Psalm 19. All of creation speaks of God. Let me go back to my notes for a minute. Verse 27. That if perhaps they might grope for him, seek him, and grope for him. Now what does that mean, grope? It means feel after, because initially we're born blind, spiritually, and he opens our eyes when we seek him. That they might feel after him and find him. That is, verify that he is real by coming in contact with him. I love that. Verify. When, when you come in contact with God, you will say, oh, this is true. This is the true God. This is the one true God. He will say to your spirit, when you are saved, the spirit will ha say to you, Abba, Father, that is the most intimate expression of Father in Hebrew is Abba. And you will hear it if you go to Israel from the children towards their fathers. Abba, Father, he will witness with your spirit that you are a child of God. And there will be no doubt in your mind that he is God. Hallelujah. Verify by contact. Feel after him. Find him. It's like reaching out for something over here. And, ah, there it is. And he says, Abba, Father. And you say, oh, I'm in contact with the living God. <laughs> ah, not like one of these and not something that's out of my own imagination. No, no idol, no nothing. No, this is the real one. Hallelujah. <laughs> That's what I did. I groped around for a long time, let me tell you. <laughs> I did seek him. And I verified by contact. Oh, this, when the church is being the church, she says, seek him. Grope for him. And he will verify by contact that he is the one true God. Glory to God. Ah, oh, verify by contact. See, and he wants this, this Abba Father. I mean, there's none of that in Greek God culture. All the gods of Athens are far off gods. All the gods of Athens. Now, when I read this, I have to just divert for a moment. Every time I see this groping thing, it reminds me of Genesis and Sodom. There had been the two angels that came to Sodom to rescue Lot and his family because God was going to destroy Sodom because of its sin. So the homosexuals heard that these two angels were there, assumed that they were men, and wanted to have sex with them. And the angel's response was to smite them with blindness so that they could not see, even to find the door, because they groped around for it. They tried to feel for it, but they couldn't feel for it. They groped for the doorway. And I tell you this, oh, that these had groped for God instead, for they would not have been destroyed. He would have made them formerly. I have to talk with a minute with you for a minute about formerly. 
this is really good news for homosexuals and all sinners. I was a sinner. I was, and I am now, a formerly. Here's what I mean from Ephesians 2.2. 2. Paul speaks to them of the trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, that is Satan, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too, Paul says, me, I was that, the Jews were that, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Just as the people in Athens are, and Jesus is telling, Paul is telling them about Jesus, so they would know this one that can rescue them and make them formerlies too. <laughs> See, this is not a condemnation unless you turn away from this truth that God can make you a formerly. And if you look, uh, there are so many who quote 1 Corinthians 6 9, but they don't quote down through 11. So I'll quote that. And then I'll definitely speak to you. 11, and it's in my notes. 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, that is people who have sex outside marriage, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor the effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Here it is, formerly. Eleven, such were some of you. I was one. Yeah, idolater, um, covetous. I was at one time a drug addict, not a drunkard. Such were, such was I. Such were some of you, he tells the church at Corinth. But you were washed, but you were sanctified. But you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. You were washed in his name. You experienced an outward cleansing and then you were sanctified and your heart was made pure by the spirit of God. Hallelujah. Through Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Formerly such were. Oh, that those homosexuals in Sodom had groped for God. God's purpose, as Paul says here in 27 of Acts 17, that they would seek God if perhaps they might grope for him and find him. Oh, if they had groped and found. He's not far from any. He's not far from the Athenians. He's not far from you. He wasn't far from me even though I was far from him in my ways. Hallelujah. He isn't a far off God. In verse 28, here's why. Here's one of the reasons they should grope for and seek him. In him we live and move and exist. We have our being. We are. It's only because he created us that we are. It's only because he created this world that we live in this world. It's only in him. And he quotes for them some of their own Greek poets. He says, for we are also his children. Now, in this case, children means in this context that they are offspring of God. That is, God created you and me and everyone that ever has been. So in that way, you are his offspring, whether you believe in Jesus Christ or not. But we know from John 1 that you do not become a child of God until you believe into Jesus that is a son or a daughter of God until you believe into Christ Jesus. So this refers to the fact that he is a creator God. 
And so he says, we in 29, being the offspring of God, should not think he's like all these idols you're worshiping. His nature is not like the idols that represent the gods that you're worshiping. His nature is not capricious. His nature is pure and right and good. And so the divine nature is not like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and thought of man. There are many things that I used to fashion for myself as idols. I fashioned my own religion, which was a combination of Buddhism and New Age and a little sprinkling of the Lord, whatever that was. I had no relationship with him. He, this God, is not one you can make. <laughs> he's the one who made you. That's what he's telling them. All they understand is idols and their Greek God system. So he's approaching it from their position about their gods and telling them that this God, this one true creator God, is very different, and he is the true God. Now, in verse 30, I had to really work on this one. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent. Now, times of ignorance, I really had to look at that. I looked it up in the commentaries, and I think they missed it. He has overlooked, that is, the context is, he has looked beyond the times of ignorance because no one is permitted to be ignorant of God anymore. And those that were, if you look at Romans 1, let's go there for a minute. Determined their own fate. Verse 20 of Romans 1. For since the creation of the world, his, God's, invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made. Again, Psalm 19. So that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, just like these at Athens, worshiping all these idols and all these Greek gods who are not gods at all. And exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and of four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Therefore, God gave them over. He said, go ahead and do that. But now... They perished because of it, because they did not know God. The Jews, on the other hand, were made God's people by God. And when their righteous ones died, if you look at Luke 16, 23, the poor beggar Lazarus went to Abraham's bosom. That's sort of a waiting area for righteous Jews who walked in the very best way they knew, being God-fearing until Christ came and opened the way to heaven because no one had ever seen heaven before, he said, but the Son of God who came down, Son of Man who came down from heaven. So they were brought out, but these ignorant ones perished because they chose God is evident in his creation, but they chose to make idols and dream up their own God system. But now, those were the times of ignorance for these right here. Now, he looks beyond that and says, I have from before time began. 
a son prepared as a sacrifice for all mankind so that not only will the righteous of my people be saved, the ones who believe into Jesus, but also all mankind, both Jew and Gentile. So now, at great cost to God, there is salvation for everyone, hallelujah, who comes to Christ, whoever will believe into him. So he's saying, in those days, following those things was your own choice. Now he's saying, okay, we're going to go past that into this new era with my son, where if you come to him, you are saved. If you believe into him, you are saved from my wrath. He's the great reconciler. He's the one who connects you to the one who created you. What is more, God's son, Jesus Christ, will judge all men. And we're going to see Paul talk about judgment. Oh my goodness, this is not talked about in the church, even among Christians. And it is rare that you would find a Christian preacher in this country speaking of it at all, inside or outside the church. He'll say, Jesus will give you a better life. Come and see how he can make your life better. Be a better you. All those kinds of things. Judgment is coming. And Jesus will be the judge. And you can find that in John 5, 28 through 29. Jesus speaks it. He will be the judge. God has appointed him. God the Father has appointed him. So now... In verse 30, God is now declaring, now, truly then, that is, therefore, truly then, having overlooked the times of ignorance, he is declaring to men right here and right now that all people everywhere should repent. Why? 31, because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man that is Jesus Christ, whom he has appointed for that purpose, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. That is, by Jesus Christ's death and resurrection, he is proven to be the Son of God, the Christ. They don't know all the scriptures, and that's why he says it in this way, through a man whom he has appointed. A man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. Proof not just to Christians, proof not just to Jews, but proof to the whole world, because no one is raised from the dead unless they believe in Christ and, you know, we know that God will work signs and wonders like that. But in this case, this was the proof. Everyone else who is raised from the dead will die at some point. They'll reach old age. Jesus is eternal. He never died. So he was raised from the dead, never to die again. And this is the proof. Go back to Romans 1 one more time. Paul, a bondservant, verse 1, of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, Concerning his son, who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh. That is, we know that it was the Holy Spirit who impregnated Mary in a holy way. But Mary 
herself was a descendant of King David. And in verse 4, he was declared the son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. That was how everyone knew that he is the Christ. And so he raised him from the dead. That's how they know he is the appointed Christ, the one who was sent to reconcile man to God. Hallelujah. So we don't hear this in many, even missionaries' works. They will, they will go around the edge of this judgment in order to keep people's minds open. But that's not teaching the whole gospel. When they do that, why do we need a savior? There's no judgment. Oh, there's judgment. Oh, my goodness. And oh, he was raised from the dead as proof that he's the one through whom you escape judgment in the church, unfortunately, and therefore in the world, in the church that is not being the church. Nobody speaks of coming out from under the wrath of God through believing in Jesus Christ. And so many who come into the church and say words on an altar willfully disobey God, sin greatly against him even after that without any concept that they will be judged according to their deeds. Jesus says this in John 5, 27, And he, God the Father, gave him, Jesus, authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, Jesus says, for an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice, that is Jesus, and will come forth those who did good deeds to a resurrection of life and those who committed evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. And he says in Matthew 7, 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my father in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, Jesus says, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness, who sin willfully against God. The one who does the will of my Father, that one will enter heaven, not the one who sins. That is, willfully disobeys God. And so, even for the church who says, Lord, Lord, even for the church who does signs and wonders in some circles. He says, if you're sinning against me, I'll tell you this. You may be doing some of these things by some power, but it isn't mine because I never, ever, ever knew you. Beware and know that a day of judgment is coming and that if you're sinning, you can go to God and ask him to cleanse your heart and fill you with his spirit so that you're no longer jerked around by Satan because of the lust in your own heart, according to James 1. Satan dangles the carrot and the lust inside you takes it. God takes that. You don't sin anymore against God because sin is no longer in you when you're filled with God. Hallelujah. God is in you. Glory to God. So that's why. He speaks of judgment wherever he goes. A day, verse 31, in which he will judge the world, the whole world, in righteousness. God is righteousness. He, righteous. He is right in all of his judgments. And he will judge the whole world through Jesus Christ. Now, some 
when they heard this in 32, they heard of the resurrection from the dead, and they sneered. And that is, the word really means ridicule. They ridiculed Paul. Resurrection from the dead. Whoever heard of such a thing? This is ridiculous. Some, some man. But others wanted to hear Paul concerning this. They wanted to hear him again. You see, not everyone that you go to and not everyone that you speak to will receive this. Some will think you're a fool. But some, beloved, when the church is being the church and tells the whole thing, resurrection, judgment, the whole thing, some will want to hear more. God opens their hearts. And so Paul went out of the midst of the wise ones at the Areopagus, but some joined him immediately and believed, including Dionysius and a woman named Damaris and others who were with them. Some believed. That was the whole point of his sermon to them. His entire sermon was to show them that their gods were false and that there was one true God and that he sent his son, Jesus Christ. And that if they, they believe in him, they are saved from his wrath, the wrath of God. Because a day of judgment is coming. Glory to God. He didn't spare any of the truth of the gospel, beloved. And so many came to faith. Men and women who had prided themselves on their great wisdom. And had worshipped false gods. They were there at the Areopagus. They were among those who were constantly saying, Hmm, what is this new teaching we're hearing? See, that's what happens when we speak the whole thing. When we truly speak the whole gospel and don't leave out any uncomfortable truths. Don't leave out anything. People will come. People will reject you, some of them. But some will come. And that is what it is to be the church. Amen. Father, thank you for sending your son that all, everyone, even those who are worshiping false gods and have idols all around them, that everyone could be saved. That everyone would not fear the day of judgment. Anyone who would come, who would believe into your son, Jesus Christ. Jesus, who came for everyone. Whosoever would believe into you. Holy Spirit, let this go out in your power and in your wisdom. Because I have none of my own, but you are in me. And these are the words you have given me. Let it go forth and let your church have ears to hear. And let those who don't know you, just as I did not know you, let them grope and find and verify by contact, saying, Abba, Father, glory to God. Amen. The fields are white and the workers are few, but the Lord of the harvest is faithful and true. He'll send forth more workers to accomplish his plan and pour out his spirit.